Hello everybody, welcome to today's session, an introduction to healthcare interoperability and fireworks on AWS. My name is Angus McAllister, I'm product owner for AWS's open source interoperability software, and I'll be joined later in this discussion by Dr. Daniel Hodkinson, who's CTO of Black Pair Software. Let's move on to our agenda. This is what you'll be learning today. So first, the problem. What is the issue that requires interoperability? Second, what are some of the drivers for interoperability in terms of activity in the healthcare world? Thirdly, what is the industry doing about it? What is the response that's coming from it? Fourth, the HL7 FHIR standard. Fifth, some use case categories for interoperability. Then I'll be introducing the Fireworks on AWS Toolkit, and then finishing up with some pointers as to where you can learn some more. Right, let's move into the problem. So this is something which is not completely exclusive to healthcare, but it's a uh, very widespread and found very, very often. And that is that data relating to patients or other aspects of healthcare tends to be siloed in different systems. So if we look at our example on this slide here, we have our, our, our uh, um, doctor on this side who needs to access data about a patient, firstly from a patient administration system, secondly from an electronic healthcare record system, and thirdly, from a lab test system. Now, uh, most clinicians are very good at doing this because they have to do that all the time, but there comes a point when there's just so much data coming from so many different systems that their way of integrating that, uh, which it can frequently be in spreadsheets or even in their heads, uh, starts to run out of bandwidth. And so what they really need is something to do that for them, namely a single point to go to to get all those data. Now it's bad enough in single organizations, but when you've got data spread across multiple organizations, it gets even harder. So whilst there may be a single interface to go to to get data from uh, each individual organization, when you want to get the data from several of them at once, uh, say in the context of a patient uh, receiving care at, at different organizations in the course of their treatment, um, then it's you've got the same problem just at greater scale. And so once more, what you really want is that single place to go to to get all the data you need relating to the, that one patient or set of patients that you're interested in for this exercise. So that's a generic description of the problem there. At a higher level, there are a number of drivers which are actually um, accelerating the need for interoperability here. And uh, these uh, f fall into a variety of different categories. Um, the first is a set of trends. Now, it's uh, important to note that uh, interoperability is uh, a necessary condition for these, in that it's very much harder to achieve any of these without it, but it's not a sufficient condition. There's also more that you'll have to do. Right, let's talk through these. So the first of these is population health. This is the ability for health authorities to capture and forecast the state of a, a countries, a regions, a states, a counties, or a city's health. Uh, which has been growing in importance in recent years and has been especially accelerated during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is an essential tool to help authorities gauge trends and make resourcing plans to meet future health needs. And it relies very heavily on aggregating data regularly from a wide, wide variety of, of sources, which in turn requires the data to be structurally and semantically interoperable. Uh, digital health uh, which is something that's also been growing in importance in recent years, is the ability for patients, uh, clinicians, and other stakeholders involved in the provision of health to access healthcare data when and where they need to. And that's um, especially for those who are accustomed to doing much of their banking and uh, holiday bookings and uh, social interaction, etc., uh, via digital means. And uh, so the same desire is actually driving this within healthcare as well. And as with population health, this requires the supporting data to be accessible in a standard way, in a standard format, and uh, that is so that it's not necessary to customize mobile applications and web portals specifically to each system from which the data need to be obtained. 
precision medicine, which has also been growing important in recent years, is the tailoring of therapies and interventions to increasingly specialized cohorts of patients, uh, right down to the point of individual treatments. And this is based on the interaction of the genomic and clinical data. Um, and that depends very heavily on being able to access those data at the point of care, as well as uh, to have them uh, homogenous and harmonized so that they are in fact interoperable, um, which then goes on to support treatment decisions. When it comes to the treatment of complex, um, long-standing, chronic and uh, multidisciplinary uh, treat, uh, uh, conditions, the um, application of multiple disciplinary teams is very important there too. And uh, this is uh, especially important when it comes to um, sharing the data uh, for the treatment of those patients. So um, where those teams will need to share data relating to their particular specialties in order to inform the greater treatment plan for the patient in question, uh, the data need to be brought from different systems which are associated with those specialties uh, and uh, transformed and harmonized in such a way that they're actually usable by everybody involved in that multidisciplinary team. And that uh, is something that enables both greater efficiency and also greater safety for patients with such conditions re re uh, requiring teams of that nature. Uh, in addition to um, patient safety, the associated delays and wastage uh, which result from data not being easily accessible at the point of care when decisions need to be made about care uh, can be alleviated to a large extent by having the data interoperable, interoperable as well. And uh, so that can be a huge enabler for making healthcare systems more efficient. And then finally, another growing trend we've seen in recent years is that of event-driven healthcare which is when a given event, such as a patient being sorry, admitted to hospital, then gives rise to a series of other events, such as uh, the allocation of a bed, the booking of meals, the reservation of consulting rooms, etc. cetera, um, then that all happens uh, automatically. And those may well be done today in a manual fashion or at best via, via fairly brittle message-based systems. And those are uh, both difficult to create and expensive to maintain uh, uh, when it comes to changing circumstances. So they don't lend themselves to being very adaptable at all. Now, that's a set of the industry trends that are driving interoperability. There's also a whole series of uh, governmental initiatives and mandates which are um, <clears throat> also involved in this. Uh, foremost amongst those is uh, in the USA, where the 21st Century Cures Act was passed a few years ago with associated uh, final rule mandates from the Office for the National Coordinator of IT and the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, where they specify uh, particular standards and uh, implementations of those standards uh, for the interoperability and exchange of data. And uh, that's given rise to great interest in the use of these standards and of interoperability in general within the healthcare world in that country. It's not restricted to the US, however. Um, in the UK, for a number of years, there have been uh, a, a set of standards laid out for the exchange of healthcare data, and uh, those are undergoing a review at the moment and are likely to result in uh, some updated versions of those. Uh, which will make it even easier for healthcare organizations to exchange data in, in the UK in a more effective fashion uh, to support the, the trends that we looked at a moment ago. In France, we're seeing uh, an industry consultation on the use of HL7 Fire. In the EU, there's a thrust towards a digital single market to include a broader range of healthcare data. Uh, at the moment, it's um, uh, predominantly focused on the cross-border transfer of uh, of um, prescription data for patients traveling outside of their home country so that they can actually get access to the medication that they 
they require for their conditions, but it is being expanded to include a much broader range. And in India, uh, the current Digital Health Initiative is implementing an e-health policy with interoperability in mind as well. And in Australia, they, their digital health strategy is looking to implement comprehensive interoperability by 2022. And these are just a few of the countries where there are health initiatives underway which are aimed at greater interoperability and sharing of data. Uh, real estate on the slide didn't permit uh, including any more than that. So those are the primary drivers for interoperability. What is the industry's response to these? Well, there are two major bodies who have historically been involved in the creation of healthcare data standards. The first of these is Health Level 7, or HL7 for short, and their first foray into this world was with something uh, called HL7 v2, uh, which is widely adopted, but has uh, quite a few challenges. Uh, its successor, HL7 v3, and most recently, uh, FIRE, or Fast Healthcare Interoperability res Resources, about which more and on. And then the second such organization is the one known as IHE, or Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, uh, which was historically focused on the exchange of uh, imaging data, specifically for radiology. But these two standards organizations have increasingly collaborated in recent years in order to produce uh, complementary standards that are actually able to work with one another. I mentioned that we'll be talking in greater depth about the FIRE standard, and to do that today, I've got Dr. Dunmail Hodkinson, who will introduce himself after the slide. Over to you, Dunmail. Thanks, Angus. My name's Dunmail Hodkinson. By background, I'm actually a research biologist, but I've been building interoperable health information systems since before the year 2000. I'm currently the Chief Technology Officer at Black Pair Software. We're an SME that works with the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. And I'm also the immediate past chair of HL7 UK. That's the UK affiliate of HL7. And HL7 is the international organisation that's responsible for a whole group of healthcare interoperability standards, including HL7 FIRE. Health interoperability standards have got a long pedigree, with the very first standards being developed in the late 1980s and achieving pretty widespread use. So today, DICOM and HL7 are thought to be in use around 90% of hospitals in the US. And DICOM itself is the bedrock of digital imaging in healthcare. So these are good standards, but by 2010, it became apparent that these standards weren't keeping up with progress in information technology. There's a growing gulf between current technology, REST APIs and JSON, and the standards, which are using messaging through SOAP, RPC, and EBXML. The standards development methodology is really heavy and conflicted with the agile DevOps-led engineering that's becoming prevalent today. And all that resulted in it becoming a highly specialist field that's really difficult to onboard new engineers into those older standards. In response to that, in around 2010, a small group of experienced health informatics professionals started to reimagine health interoperability. What would health interoperability look like in the internet age? And their proposal, first published as a draft standard for trial use in September 20th, sorry, September the 30th, 2014, it's called FIRE. This drew on the best features of all those previous standards, not throwing away all that learning, but leveraging latest web standards and really focusing on implementability. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what HL7 FIRE actually is. So first and foremost, FIRE is an international healthcare interoperability standard. FIRE itself stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. The core specification for HL7 FIRE defines, firstly, what are called resources. These are modular components. They define data models for entities that can be found in the health domain. And those resources can be assembled 
into working systems to solve real world clinical and administrative problems. In parallel to the resources, which you can think of as data models, there are methods and ways that we can exchange those resources. The first and most popular and widespread is as an API, and that's a modern RESTful API for exchanging fire resources. But the specification also includes messaging, transactions, and bulk data extract. So to give you some examples of resources, there are fire resources describing a patient. That's an individual who might receive care. There are fire resources. There's a fire resource describing a practitioner. So that's actually an individual who's providing care. There are fire resources for a condition. So that would be a clinical diagnosis that's a concern. It's a fire resource for an observation. That's a measurement or an assertion about a patient or a device or any other subject. So that might be a blood pressure. There's even fire resources which help with the administrative side of healthcare, such as a claim resource, which would allow a provider to reclaim money maybe from an insurance provider who is responsible for the patient. So there's a wide selection of resources which is growing over time, modeling different parts of the healthcare domain. Those resources are built on a common set of data types. That includes data types that you would expect, simple ones such as IDs, strings, dates, integers. It includes complex data types, addresses, human names. But most importantly, it includes data types specific to the health domain. For example, there is a codable concept. This allows you to record um, a specific term from a clinical terminology. So we might be able to record the term from the SNOMED CT terminology for type one diabetes within a condition resource. And that would allow us to say that a patient has a particular condition. So we've got a rich set of resources with the sharing a set of common data types. One of the grounding principles of FHIR is it makes extensive use of discoverable and computable metadata. For example, an app or a service can interrogate any FHIR server at runtime to retrieve what's called the capability statement resource. This defines the capabilities offered by that particular server. And as a developer, you can adjust the behavior of your app or your service accordingly. This sort of approach, this discoverable computable approach is followed throughout the entire um, FHIR specification. For example, every single resource type is actually formally defined using a FHIR structure definition resource. Every search is defined as a search parameter resource and so forth. So it makes it very tractable to modern tooling. One of the really big lessons from previous standards was that it's impossible to produce a standard that will cover every single possible use case globally. FHIR recognizes that. So the FHIR target is to solve the 80% of the most common use cases and accept that the remaining 20% will not be solved just using the core standard. To achieve this, FHIR provides formal mechanisms to extend the standard where domains or use cases have got specific business rules. Firstly, FHIR allows us to define what are called extensions. These are formal methods for adding additional fields into a data model. To give you an example, in the US, it's a regulatory requirement that the ethnicity of a patient is recorded. The FHIR patient resource in the core standard doesn't include ethnicity. But by using a US core ethnicity extension, you can add a field to a patient resource to record ethnicity, and it'll be chosen from a set of codes published by the CDC. Similarly, different domains, different use cases may have specific business rules that need to be implemented. For example, in the UK, all patients should be identified using what we call an NHS number. That's a unique identifier issued by the National Health Service. FHIR 
allows us to define profiles of resources. This allows us to layer additional constraints on data models for each resource type. So in the UK, profiles have been developed as part of what's called the Care Connect programme, define UK specific rules. And that includes the rule that a UK patient must have an NHS number identifier. So we have a core national, sorry, we have a core international specification, which covers 80% of use cases, but we expect that local organisations and local domains will localise and extend to satisfy their own requirements. And that's built into the specification. And that localization effort that we see in the UK and the US is happening globally. It's been led by local HL7 affiliates. We see it happening in the US. It's happening in the UK. It's happening in Australia, in the Netherlands, in Germany, and a host of other countries. That means that today, HL7 Fire has become the de facto global standard for all new healthcare interoperability projects. I'm going to hand you back to Angus now, who's going to show you how the HL7 FHIR standard can be applied to solve a range of different health interoperability problems. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for that succinct and very well explained introduction to the FHIR standard. I promised that we'd be taking a look at some of the categories of use cases for interoperability so that you've got a better feel for what sort of things are likely to come up. The first of these is for a generic or standard fire server. This is essentially an implementation of the fire specification that provides an interface and the underlying storage for data which conform to the fire standard. This tends to be something that is only really found for greenfield deployment. And in the healthcare world, there tends to be a lot of historical data around. So in practice, it's fairly rare. So we won't spend too much longer on that one. Our second category is that of data aggregation, which supports a whole range of, of the industry trends, which we mentioned earlier on in this session. And this is where we have a series of uh, clients, uh, uh, actors on the left-hand side here, who need access to the data which derives from these medical source systems over here via a fire interface over here. And to do that, the data needs to be ingested and brought over into the system such that uh, uh, they're accessible via that fire interface. The third use case category, one which we'll be going into in most detail, is that of data exchange where the fire specification is used to implement the fire interface here and uh, have either one-way or two-way interaction with these medical source systems at the back here. And this can support uh, either apps or web portals on the left-hand side accessing these data and updating the data in there as well with the transformation uh, undertaken in the uh, data ingestion or transformation stage over here. So in support of this third use case, we released publicly a few months back the Fireworks on AWS Open Source Toolkit. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to what this is all about. Firstly, where does it fit? On the left-hand side, we have our clients, as we do in the use case categories I've mentioned a short while ago, who need access to the data residing in these health systems in an organizational data center, which may or may not have a healthcare data integration engine associated with them. And in order to do that, we put in place the Fireworks and AWS Toolkit within an AWS's, an AWS account, and that is connected to the customer data center via suitable means such as an AWS Direct Connect and uh, the data are exchanged via this, this, uh, this link over here. To give you a conceptual overview of how this is actually done, the toolkit comprises four major components. Uh, the first is an implementation of the fire interface on the left hand side here. Uh, the second is the actual logic implementing the fire specification. 
And the third is an optional persistence store where data can actually be held uh, to be accessed directly through the fire interface or via uh, or, or, or stored in when extracted from these backend systems for which the third component the integration framework is what's required and then uh, <clears throat> uh, the that consists of a set of integration transforms which are pluggable modules enabling backend systems over here uh, to have data extracted from them and transformed and brought either into the persistent store or served via the fire interface here depending on the use case category question so there'll be much more detail on this later on but uh, if you'd like to know more um, i strongly recommend that you stay tuned for the next session in this two-part series which is a deeper dive session on the fireworks toolkit and uh, if you want to know more about fire uh, let me refer you to these two links on the fire website uh, from both an architect's and a developer's perspective and then also to the blog post we published announcing the release of the fireworks and aws toolkit uh, which you'll get from this link over here in addition to the deep dive session on fireworks on AWS, there is also a series of other healthcare related sessions during the reInvent. So please do tune into those as well. And I hope you find those very beneficial, informative and useful. So I just want to finish off by saying thank you very much indeed for your attention and engagement today. And please do fill out the survey following this session, giving us your feedback as to what went well and what we could do better. Thank you very much.